Amen. Good evening. Just a few of us here tonight. We trust more are on their way tomorrow. We're going to start with a very basic uh, overview of what true education is before we get into uh, more details and more practical application tomorrow. Now, I realize as you advertise a seminar about education, people start thinking, well, that must be for teachers, right? <laughs> well, we're told in, the, in his wisdom, the Lord has decreed that the family shall be the greatest of all educational agencies. So this is not, when we talk about education, we're not just talking to teachers, but maybe it's just for teachers and parents, just for people who have charge of little children. We're also told in the school of Christ, students are never graduated. Among the pupils are both old and young. Those who give heed to the instructions of the divine teacher constantly advance in wisdom, refinement, and nobility of soul, and thus they are prepared to enter that higher school where advancement will continue throughout eternity. So true education applies to, let's see, who's our youngest one here? I think that's Jenna. I won't ask who's the oldest one, but this applies to every one of us, right? <laughs> and it doesn't stop just here on this earth. It continues throughout eternity. Someone's volunteering as the oldest, I think. Right? <laughs> it's all of us, though. As we draw closer to Jesus, as we advance in wisdom, refinement, nobility of soul, this is the process of true education that will continue throughout eternity. And to put it even more simply, I love that statement in the book Education, which says, in the highest sense, the work of education and the work of redemption are one. How many of us want to experience that work of redemption? So this applies to every one of us, this topic. Now, this topic is a big topic. There's no way that we could cover it all in uh, even a weekend, <laughs> let alone just this evening but I hope we can get a good overview throughout this weekend. I want to start with a little story, and I should also mention for those who were here for the Adventist Heritage Weekend in October, I'm going to be doing a little bit of review from a few things that I talked about that weekend. But, so if you've already heard it, uh, repetition deepens impression, right? <laughs> so the story goes, and it's a true story, that Edward, who was Prince of Wales, was born November 2nd, 1470, during a time of great turmoil in England. But despite the, the chaos in the kingdom at the time, his education was not neglected in any way. And in 1473, a series of regulations and guidelines were drawn up by the king regarding the education of his son. That would make sense, right? A king is going to carefully outline how he wants his son to be educated. Here's how it went. I'll read here from uh, the article I was reading. In the morning, the prince was to be awakened at a good hour according to his age. Mass was performed in the prince's chapel or closet, and no man was to interrupt the prince during Mass. So evidently there was a start of the day in religious things. The prince then had breakfast, followed by virtuous learning appropriate for his age. At 10 o'clock in the morning, he had lunch. That seems to indicate his rising must have been quite early if he's having lunch at 10 a.m. No one was to sit at the prince's table except those thought fit by the earl. The meal was accompanied by the reading of noble stories, which encouraged virtue, honor, knowledge, and wisdom, and deeds of worship. There was to be nothing in the stories that would move or stir him to vice. So we had a start of the day with uh, religious things. We had an early start to the day. We had a careful instruction as to the environment and the, the influences around this prince, and even dictating his reading material, making sure there was nothing in there that would put uh, bad thoughts into his mind. After this meal, the prince received instruction in grammar, music, and humanities, and then he was to spend the rest of his afternoons in physical activities. And we're going to be seeing later how the benefits of physical activity as part of education. So we see how carefully outlined and structured was a prince's education by the king himself. Such careful attention given 
to the education of the heir of an earthly throne. But what about us? Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 16. The Bible says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And verse 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Children of God, the Bible calls us. Heirs of a heavenly kingdom. And in 1 Peter, we can turn there, 1 Peter chapter 2. Probably many of us know this verse well. 1 Peter chapter 2. If I can get to it here. There we go. And verse 9. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we see in Edward, Prince of Wales, that his father, the king, was very careful about his education. We see that the Bible tells us that we are heirs to a heavenly kingdom. In other words, we, if we are parents or teachers, we are working directly in educating royalty. But even if we're not a parent or a teacher, God wants to educate us as heirs to a heavenly kingdom. And if The Prince of Wales, if his father was super detailed about how he was to be educated, do you think the king of the universe might have outlined how he wants his children to be educated? Would he just leave that to chance for us just to figure out how we're supposed to be educating ourselves and our children for eternity? (laughs) I sure don't think so. Now, the principles of true education are as old as the world. They began in the Garden of Eden, and they were applied in the life of Abraham, we could see, and the children of Israel on through history. There are many examples in (coughs) the scriptures in the Bible uh, as to the, the principles of true education, but it was made much more clear in our modern times through the pen of the Spirit of Prophecy, through the pen of Ellen White, especially in the book Education. I forgot to bring a copy up here with me, but the book Education, one of my favorites, as it clearly outlines these principles of true education that are given to to God's last day's people as a special emphasis as we're on the borders of heaven. We see the world coming to a close, God has given us a special emphasis on education here in these last days. And the book Education is probably, again, one of my favorites, one of the most clear. Uh, Educational leaders in the state of Mysore, India, used the book Education to help shape their system of education after they gained independence as a state in 1947. I was visiting a Ghanaian church uh, some time ago. That's from the country of Ghana, Africa. And they told me the story that some years ago during a time of significant change and improvement in the educational system in the nation of Ghana, Africa, Seventh-day Adventist leaders were visiting the Secretary of Education for the country and were surprised to see a well-worn copy of the book Education laying on his desk. And they asked the man, well, have you been reading that book? He goes, that's the source of all the changes we're making in this country. <laughs> Professor John Michaelis of the University of Berkeley, California, University of California, Berkeley, I guess they say that. Um, he read the book Education after he had written his own book on education, and he said, this book is 50 years ahead of its time. Why did I need to write my book on education? Dr. Florence Stratemeyer of Columbia University, she's one of the world's leading curriculum authorities, She also stated that the book Education was 50 years ahead of its time. She was one time asked to give a lecture on education to Seventh-day Adventist teachers, 
And her source for the principles of education she laid out in her talk was the book Education. She stated, this is quoting, she's a Roman Catholic, Dr. Florence Stratemeyer from Columbia University, the, speaking of the book Education, the breadth and depth of its philosophy amaze me. Its concept of balanced education, harmonious development, and of thinking and acting on principle are advanced educational concepts. The objective of restoring in man the image of God, the teaching of parental responsibility, and the emphasis on self-control in the child are ideals the world desperately needs. Spoken to us as a people. Friends, when the king (laughs) has outlined how he wants his children to be educated, we'd best be on the edge of our seats to listen and respond. And we are told now as never before. That tells me there must be something urgent about it right now, at this period in earth's history. Now as never before, we need to understand the true science of education. If we fail to understand this, we shall never have a place in the kingdom of God. And I think about the history of the nation of Israel. It's a study we don't have time for right now. But when you look at the reasons why they rejected Jesus, why they didn't recognize him as their Messiah when he came. It was a direct result of influences of worldly systems of education upon their own system of education. It was a mixing of the worldly system of education of the the day with their own God-given system of education, so much so that it clouded their minds. They were not following true education, and they did not recognize their deliverer when he came. Is it possible that now, On the borders of Jesus' second coming, Satan would seek to confuse our ideas of education so that we will not be prepared to recognize him when he comes. If we fail to understand it, we shall never have a place in the kingdom of God, because in the highest sense, the work of education and the work of redemption are one. We should also remember the great controversy. This controversy between Christ and Satan, between good and evil, and in this controversy are these two kingdoms, these two governments at odds with each other, opposing each other, working against each other. Now, any government will have its own educational system preparing citizens to live and function in its government. Am I correct? I mean, (laughs) that would be a good government that did that. And it's the same in this great controversy. We have a, a government of Satan that's focused purely on success in this world. And then we have the government of God that seeks to prepare us for his kingdom, which he said is not of this world. So each government will need to have its own educational system preparing its citizens to function in its government. So we really have a true education and a false education simply by the fact that there is a false government in the universe and a true government of God, both with completely different focuses, both with completely different goals, and certainly different destinies for those who are part of the respective systems of education. Let me say it this way. Education is not about information. Many times we take education to just be about the stuff you put into your mind, the knowledge you put in your mind, the textbooks you go through, the things you learn in school. Friends, that's not education. That's only a portion, only a tiny part of education But education is not merely informational. Education is transformational. Whether we are part of the false system of education or the true system of education, we are being transformed for either one government or the other. The question is, which system are we a a part of? For which kingdom is our character being transformed? Now, there's something else that struck me quite strongly when I first read it. 
The reason why the youth of the present age are not more religiously inclined is, now I've cut it off right there because I want us to think about this. This is the question everyone is asking, right? Why are youth leaving the church? Why is my son, my daughter, not interested in spiritual things? We have sermons preached on this topic. We could fill a library with the books that have been written on this topic. What's the answer? Why are the youth of today not more religiously inclined? Which answer do we want? Do we want man's philosophies (laughs) or do we want God's response? The reason why the youth of the present age are not more religiously inclined is that their education is defective. Now, when I first read that, it just (laughs) kind of hits you pretty hard. Like, we can look at the failures, we can look at the problems we see in our youth today and directly trace that to a defective education. Perhaps because they're part of the wrong system? Perhaps because their character is being transformed to only have success on this earth and not success in heaven? Perhaps their educational program has the wrong focus and the wrong goal? And yet we saw earlier that in his wisdom, the Lord has decreed that the family shall be the greatest of all educational agencies. So if the reason our youth are not interested in spiritual things is a result of defective education, but in his wisdom, the Lord has decreed that the family is the greatest of educational agencies, then who's to blame for the defective education of our youth today if it's not the family? Now, I recognize that could seem... um, discouraging, right? (laughs) You know, we just identified the problem. It's the families who are neglecting the proper education of their children that's creating a lack of religious interest in our young people. That could be discouraging, but I don't want it to be discouraging. This could also be encouraging because this tells us that we have it in our power to give our young people the proper education so that they will be interested in spiritual things. That should be encouraging to us. So, with that introduction, (laughs) what really is true education? How can we boil this down into the basics to understand and start to grasp this huge topic? But I just, again, want to say this is a huge topic because this concerns our redemption. It's not just one little thing that we can point to and say, okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to get a curriculum for true education. And no, it, it just doesn't work that way. True education involves our entire life and our entire preparation for heaven. So when we start to embark on the journey, and I, I do a lot of consulting with families and something I always tell them, as you start on true education, this is a lifestyle change. This isn't something you just start to do for a few hours a day or a certain book you give your children. So three core principles of true education that we can identify, and we're going to go through these in detail, but I want to establish them first. First of all, as we've already seen, true education and redemption are synonymous to restore the image of God in the soul. Secondly, true education is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. Now, that's as opposed to the conventional systems of education, which are focused purely on mental development, usually. And then thirdly, true education is preparation for service here and then throughout eternity. Let's unpack these a little bit in the remaining time we have this evening. True education and redemption being synonymous. Now, we've seen already, in the highest sense, the work of education and redemption are one. So, if we use this as a standard of measurement, and we begin to analyze the parts of a child's educational process, and we could even take that into whatever we are doing in our day-to-day life, and we analyze the activities, we analyze the textbook, we analyze uh, everything that happens throughout the daily life, we can ask the question, or we should ask the question, is this focused or will this help toward the redemption of my child? Ask that question. Think about it. As you're engaged in their education, will this help in their redemption? Is it focused on preparing them for heaven or only success on this earth. The true object of education is to restore the image of God in the soul. But why? 
Well, we'd find the answer for that if we went to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 27. We know this verse well, I'm sure. God created man in whose image? In his own image. But then sin came along, we know the story, how sin entered the world and has damaged the image of God. In fact, it's hardly recognizable in man today. So God created man in his image, but then something needs to be done to restore him back to his image because sin came along and destroyed it. So what is going to be done to restore in man God's image? That's the work of true education, to restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul, that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be the work of redemption. Now we all know that. Of course, that's a work of redemption, to restore in man the image of God. But it didn't stop there. It says this is also the work of education and the great object of life. So in other words, our entire existence, everything we do should be focused on restoring in us the image of God. Again, it's analyzing everything we do, every instruction we give, every textbook, every activity, and saying, is this focused on preparation for heaven? Will this transform the character to be more like Jesus or no? Now, where do we begin with this? Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 tells us very clearly, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Now, it's pretty easy to gloss over this, and we, we often read this and say, oh, okay, yeah, that's why we have a Bible class. Well, let's think about this. Wisdom, understanding, those are educational terms. And it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So where do you start in true education, where do you start in gaining wisdom? You start with the fear of the Lord, a recognition of who He is, and a respect for His commandments. But then it says, the knowledge of the holy is understanding. What's the difference between the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of the holy? The fear of the Lord is that recognition of who God is and a respect for His commandments, and that obedience is the happy way <laughs> to live. But then the knowledge of the holy, in the Hebrew mind, when we see this word knowledge in the Bible, this is not speaking of information. When we say knowledge today, we usually think it's just information, right? Just, you know, you know about something. Not in the Hebrew mind. That word knowledge means an intimate relationship and a connection with someone. So the Bible's telling us that if you connect yourself with God you will have understanding. True wisdom is to be connected with God, to commune with Him, to receive instruction from Him. This is the beginning. This is the sum of true education. Now, of course, this begins in the home as the little ones are connected with mom and dad, and they learn to experience a connection with God as they grow. A few more statements on this. The very foundation of true education is in the fear of the Lord. The Bible should be made the foundation of education. The Bible should be made the foundation of study and teaching. Now let's, you know, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's a foundation. We read the foundation of education is in the fear of the Lord. The Bible's the foundation. We hear this word foundation. What does a foundation mean? Anyone here build a house? Has anyone? Okay, <laughs> someone. I, at least you've seen one built, maybe, if you haven't built one yourself. Imagine, though, just to give a little analogy here, imagine you were wanting to build a house. But as you thought about the process, as you were planning to do so, you realized you didn't have enough money for the whole process. Perhaps that would be reality if you went to do that. I don't know. But either way, as you started to build your house, as you, as you were planning to build your house, you realized you would not have enough money. So you thought about it. And you said, well, I'm going to have to leave something off this process, but I need a roof over my head. So I, I need to start even though I don't have enough money. There's just some aspects I'm not going to be able to finish. And so you think about what you could leave off of this house building project. And you think, well, I need walls. It's not a house without walls. <laughs> I need a roof. I'm going to get pretty wet without a roof. Um, doors and windows, pretty essential. 
paint. I could do without paint. No, people are going to think my house is ugly if I don't have paint. Uh, flowers, landscaping. I really could. No, no, I got, I got to have flowers and landscaping because people would, wouldn't like my house if I didn't have flowers and landscaping. What could I leave off my house that nobody would see? Oh, the foundation. <laughs> nobody will see if I don't put a foundation under it. Is that true? Well, you're like, maybe. It is true. They would not see that you didn't have a foundation in your house. But would they see the results of your lack of foundation? Absolutely. When that house starts leaning over and, <laughs> and uh, having problems, they're going to know that you didn't put a good foundation under it. So when we read about a foundation, the fear of the Lord, the foundation of true education, the Bible, the foundation of education, and knowledge of the holy. It's speaking about that relationship, and this is done, of course, in the home with the parents and the children, the foundation. The foundation is something that you do that people don't see. But many times in education today, we focus a lot on what people notice. The grades, the honors, the performance, the degrees, the amount of money you make, the, you know the list, right? All these things that everyone notices and sees, and it makes parents proud. <laughs> but that's just the walls. That's just the roof. That's just the flowers around the outside. The foundation is laid in the things that people don't notice. The foundation is laid in the home, in morning and evening worship. The foundation is laid as parents talk and walk with their children, how Deuteronomy says, all day, every day, developing a relationship. The foundation is laid in those things that people don't see. Many times we notice a child who maybe can get up front and recite their memory verses or they can do special music or something like that, and those are good things, but that's just paint on the walls. <laughs> that's not the indicator of a good character. Good character is laid in the quiet instruction, daily instruction within the home. There's a lot more we could talk about in context of education and redemption. But let's remember, God is the source of wisdom. And we find the source in His Word and in nature. So let's make that our source of true education. I want to spend a little more time on the harmonious development of, of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. I didn't make this up. Uh, this comes from the book Education, how true education is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. A little more uh, expounded upon here that true education is the preparation of the physical, mental, and moral powers for the performance of every duty. It is the training of body, mind, and soul for the divine service. And this is the education that will endure until eternal life. We want an education that endures to eternal life. So an education that will not endure to eternal life is one that will just focus on maybe on one of these three areas, as conventional education does today, focusing on the mind usually. But an education that focuses on the development of the whole being, the body, mind, and the soul, that's the education that will endure until um, or into eternity. That's a preparation for eternity. Now, the reason for this is that when we are created, God created us with these three parts of our being. We have our bodies, physical bodies. We have the mind or the mental abilities. And then we also have the soul or the heart, or we would say spiritual capacities and moral abilities. So we have physical, mental, and spiritual parts of our being. So if all three of those were damaged when sin entered the world, and true education is to restore those three areas, then we need to focus on a harmonious development of all three. Now, we saw, back to this one, it says harmonious development. What does harmonious mean? Can anyone give me a definition of that word? Working together, okay. Any others? James, Paul, Jenna, do you know what the word harmonious means? Have you heard of the word harmony in music? Yeah? What does that mean? Do you know? Not sure? <laughs> it means it sounds good. All right, and that's key. 
Harmony in music is when multiple parts are blending together. But imagine you were listening to a quartet where you have the bass, tenor, alto, and lead, or soprano, and all of a sudden the tenor starts singing more loudly than everyone else. Is that going to be harmonious anymore? No, you lose the harmony, right? So another word we could, we could use would be equilibrium. All three, uh, mental, physical, and spiritual, are going to be in, in equilibrium, equal parts, all working together, all, all um, in equal development, not one stronger than the other. Let's talk about these individually and the importance of each one. <clears throat> we find a fascinating statement here in Child Guidance. Both mental and spiritual vigor, there we find two, are in a great de degree dependent upon, there's our third one, physical strength and activity. Whatever promotes physical health promotes the development of a strong mind and a well-balanced character. So it says mental and spiritual are dependent on what? On physical. Now, this is fascinating. And this is something, again, you know, don't have time to expound on all of this and study it out fully. But we find that God has created us where our mental and our spiritual abilities, and this is borne out by secular science now, they are helped and, and really fueled by sufficient physical development. So if you don't have enough physical activity and development, especially during childhood, the mental abilities won't develop properly. Many times children who are having um, learning disabilities, if we take them out of the classroom where they're being told to sit all the time and we simply give them physical activity, it will often fix a lot of those problems because mental strength is dependent on physical activity, physical strength and activity. And the same thing we find with spiritual strength. So let's talk a little bit about physical activity. Secular science has found physical activity improves the overall mental health and quality of life. It enhances brain function and cognition, improves behavior, improves concentration, increases the blood and oxygen flow to the brain, increases the levels of norepinephrine and endorphins, resulting in a reduction of stress and an improvement of mood, and increases growth factors that help create new nerve cells and support synaptic plasticity. What a list, right? All these benefits of physical activity. By the way, that's from the American Medical Association of Pediatrics. Another study found higher fit children showed greater bilateral hippocampal volumes and superior relational memory task performance compared to lower fit children. Now that's a mouthful. That's just a scientist making it as complicated as he possibly can. Basically, he's saying higher fit children, in other words, children that were more active and fit, they had larger hippocampus volumes, and we know that the hippocampus is a part of the brain that's very responsible for memory and spatial navigation. So it actually improved their memories when they were more active. Another study found exercise provides an unparalleled stimulus, creating an environment in which the brain is ready, willing, and able to learn. And I could go on for the next hour listing all the secular science that has shown the benefits of physical activity for both mental strength and spiritual strength, and physical strength, of course, in the process. So you may be saying, well, okay, how do, I, how do I know, like, how much time do I need to spend studying? How much time do I need to work on, on physical activity? We find a principle here, and this could be borne out by the secular science also. The time of study must be divided between the gaining of book knowledge and a securing of a knowledge of practical work. Now, when you divide something, usually, do you uh, cut just a little tiny piece off the edge? <laughs> Usually when you divide something, you're talking about cutting it into equal portions, right? I mean, imagine one day you were at your house and uh, you, you were just by yourself and there was one piece of cake left. Good cake, healthy cake. I don't know if that's possible. But <laughs> and uh, you, you were, you thought, you know what? I'm just going to have a treat. So you get that piece of cake you put it on, the, on your plate, and you get a fork, and you go to sit down at the table, and you're just about to take a bite, and you hear a knock on the door. And before you have a chance to hide your cake, your friend walks in. He's a good friend. He just comes in without bothering for you to answer the door. And your friend walks right in. Oh, you have some cake. Hey, let's share this. And you're thinking, I knew you were going to say that. Okay, okay, I'll share it with you. 
So you go to the kitchen, you get another plate, you get a knife, you get him a fork, you bring it back, and your friend says, all right, let's divide this. You say, okay, I'll divide it. And you cut just a tiny little sliver off the edge of that cake. It's, it's translucent. You can see through it. And you put that on his plate and hand it to your friend. <laughs> What's he going to say? It's me like, I said divide it. You did not divide it. You gave me a tiny little remnant off the edge. So when the God tells us, divide the time between book study and practical work, does he mean that we spend the whole day studying uh, out of the books and then we shave just 20 minutes off the edge to go, you know, take a run? No, he's talking about a major portion of the day spent in practical work. And don't get confused, this doesn't mean just exercise. This is, it says, securing of a knowledge of practical work. That doesn't say go for a run or a cycle. That's saying practical work, useful duties around the home. In fact, we could kind of divide physical training into three main areas. We have useful work. Those are the daily activities of the home. Every child should be trained in those things. Washing dishes, doing the laundry, sweeping the floor, you know, stuff like that. Practical stuff. Everybody needs to learn that. Manual training, where you're training a specific skill or a trade, as well as generally learning about the health of the body and applying the health principles into the life would be an aspect of physical development. And there are many benefits to useful work. So many things that children learn through that. This is a fascinating statement. The greatest benefit is not gained from exercise that's taken as play or exercise merely. There is some benefit in being in the fresh air and also from the exercise of the muscles, but let the same amount of energy be given to the performance of useful work and the benefit will be greater. But if we look at conventional education today, where they have the prime, the the majority of the time is focused on mental development, but then they'll have a little bit of time in physical time, physical development. What are they doing during that time, that physical development time? Usually it's either play, exercise, or just exercise just to exercise, or competitive sports, right? It's saying, well, yeah, there's some benefit to being in the fresh air, although most of the time it's in the gym these days, (laughs) and exercising the muscles. But if we want to get the greatest benefit, where do we find it? Not just in exercising, but in doing something useful. God designed us to be useful. He wanted us to work and be happy and apply ourselves to something more than just taking a run. (laughs) And uh, of course, we could talk about the whole aspect of competitive sports and how those are not good for our characters. Um, That's a topic for another day, though. Physical employment is part of the training essential for every youth. How important is it? It's essential. An important phase of education is lacking if the student is not taught how to engage in useful labor. If we are not teaching our young people how to be useful, they're missing out on true education. Every man, woman, and child should be educated to practical, useful work. Amen. And then the other aspect of that, which I'll mention briefly, is manual training, where, again, where you're training a specific trade. Manual training is deserving of far more attention than it has received. If we study the history of Israel, we find that God gave special instructions to them that even if they were wealthy and would never need to work, they could just pay servants for everything. It was a fundamental, essential aspect of their children's education to learn a trade. It was just, no matter if they'd never use it, it was recognized as necessary for their education and for, um, for their character development. And um, we find this should start early. When the child is old enough to be sent to school, the teacher should cooperate with the parents, and manual training should be continued as part of the school study. So it began in the home. It's then continued in the school. And then we read, every youth on leaving school should have acquired a knowledge of some trade or occupation by which, if need be, he may earn a livelihood. This is just practical advice. I mean, most of this is so common sense that we should be teaching our children these things. Um, But thankfully, the Lord has has directed us also and told us this is a part of true education. The best form of physical activity, no presentation on true education would be complete without mentioning 
one vital aspect of uh, physical development, and that is agriculture. We read no line of manual training is of more value than agriculture. This should be a fundamental part of every child's education um, and adults. <laughs> Why agriculture? Well, there are many, many reasons. Let me just list a few. They found that children who are involved in gardening have better self-confidence, better self-esteem, and that's not just a prideful thing. That's talking about a sense of self-worth, which is very valuable. Children are more patient and persevering when they are involved in gardening. Now, (laughs) I have to laugh. Did we need millions of dollars of scientific research to tell us that gardening will teach you to be more patient and persevering? Who's grown a garden? I think all of us here, right? So can you get your smartphone and get an app for tomatoes and just press a few buttons and some tomatoes come out? (laughs) It doesn't work that way, right? You have to plant them and care for them and water them and weed them and pray over them. And with the Lord's blessing, you'll get some tomatoes. So of course it teaches patience and perseverance. We didn't need secular research to tell us that. It improves science understanding, the research tells us. And again, that, that goes a little bit without saying. Children actually have better test scores. They found children who um, are in school programs where part of the day is spent in agriculture or gardening of some kind, they actually get better test scores, even with less time spent in the classroom. And overall, better learners um, as a result of being in the garden. I'll share one study here. The experimental group of gardening students outperformed the control group of non-gardening students in all areas. In general information, reading recognition, reading comprehension, total reading, mathematics, spelling, and written language. And I just find this fascinating because what do any of these things have to do with gardening? (laughs) Nothing really, right? But the fact that they were involved in gardening actually helped strengthen their mind, as we read earlier, how the mental strength is dependent upon the physical development, and so they were able to do better in those things just as a result of being in the garden. There's also something else that has been found called Mycobacterium vacai. This is a bacteria. Now, we know in the world there's uh, good bacteria and bad bacteria. And the hope is that the good ones stay in more plentiful than the bad ones and we stay healthy. Let me tell you about a good one, Mycobacterium vacai. This bacteria um, has been found to reduce depression, to improve lung health. We could use a little bit of that in today's day and age, couldn't we? Boost the immune system. Could we use that also today in this world? Fight cancer. Who wants some of this already? (laughs) Strengthen the digestive system treat arthritis, improve emotional and mental health, lower stress and anxiety, reduce allergies, and even raise your IQ and make you smarter. Now who wants some of this bacteria? (laughs) Unfortunately, you're not going to find it in a pill at the health food store. (laughs) It is a component of the dirt in which you grow your garden. But no, you don't need to eat dirt. You can just put your hands in the soil and you will actually, they find you absorb it underneath your fingernails. Going barefoot in the garden, same thing. Just eating the vegetables out of the garden. And they even find breathing the dust that gets kicked up. Um, you know, when it gets a little bit dry and you get the, the, the dust, not dust in your house, but dust from the dirt, the real dirt outside, you, in it, you get some of this bacteria. They find that children who are raised on farms have less than half the incidence of allergies and asthma compared to those living in the city. And they have linked it now to the natural bacteria that they're exposed to as part of their lifestyle, and it actually makes them healthier. They found this bacteria had the same effect as antidepressant drugs. Notice the title of this study is Dirt, or the the article is Dirt, the new Prozac. (laughs) <laughs> That's an antidepressant drug. And they find this uh, bacteria affects the brain in the same chemical way as Prozac without the negative side effects to go along with it. Uh, someone was telling me of a study they did in um, elderly care facilities where they had patients who were experiencing depression. They would have them simply soak their hands in moist soil. And it, it improved I improved their, their depression problems. Actually, some of them were cured from their depression problems from putting their hands in the soil. Pretty amazing. 
There's so many other um, aspects we could talk about this. Gardening is definitely a place for every child. And think about all the academic subjects you can learn in the garden too. If you're intentional about it, they can learn counting, measuring, um, you know, division, multiplication, subtraction, addition, so many things that can be learned. You can learn so much science as part of being in the garden. And um, this is just one of the huge benefits of living in the country. And this is a, an ideal environment for children. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, mental... Oh, sorry, I can't skip that one before we get to mental development. The Garden of Eden was not only Adam's dwelling, but his schoolroom. <laughs> I love that. This is a place that God wants to educate us in the garden. And we're told study in agricultural lines should be the A, B, and C of the educational work in our school. This is the very first work that must be entered upon. What's A, B, and C? When you teach the alphabet, do you start with Z or do you start with A? <laughs> you start with A, right? So when you're going to start in the process of educating, you want to start with using agriculture. It is the A, B, and C. There are more letters to the alphabet. <laughs> Some people take agriculture as that's true education. No, it's the start. And it's a very important component, although it's not the sum total. All right, now I want to talk a little bit about mental development. The world focuses pretty heavily on mental development, but I would suggest that even the world's focus on mental development is a bit misguided and sort of one-sided, not a complete picture of mental development. Because the world's focus on mental development is cramming the mind with information so you can finish and you can graduate and you can get a, a degree and then probably another degree and another degree and make a good uh, living and, you know, very self-centered, very focused on the information I can gain and what my accomplishments are. Very little focus in conventional education today on benefiting someone else. But we're told he is a Christian who aims to reach the highest attainments. Is there anything wrong with reaching high attainments? No. He is a Christian who aims to reach the highest attainments, but he has a purpose for the purpose of doing others good. We're on this earth to benefit others. And so the information that we gain, the knowledge that we're taking in as part of our educational process and what we're teaching our children should be focused on helping them to learn to serve others and to do others good. And of course, along with that goes finishing the work on this earth, spreading the gospel so Jesus can come. Now, it's interesting to contrast this with the false system of education, I want to read a statement here from Studies in Christian Education, written by the educational pioneer about 100 years ago, E.A. Sutherland, Dr. E.A. Sutherland. Um, he helped found the Madison School and was very well recognized for his incredible insights into true education. And he wrote the book Studies in Christian Education, where, or actually it was collected from a series of lectures, where he compared true and false education, and he traced this system and this attack on true education and these working against each other of these two systems of education. So here he describes the false system of education as it developed as part of the Counter-Reformation. Now that should make us think a little bit. If there was a system of education developed as part of the Counter-Reformation, it was working against the principles of the Protestant Reformation, and it's not one that we want to follow. But here's a description of it. The memory was cultivated as a means of keeping down or suppressing free activity of thought and clearness of judgment. It sought showy results with which to dazzle the world. A well-rounded development was nothing. The Jesuits did not aim at developing all the faculties of their pupils. When a student could make a brilliant display from the resources of a well-stored memory, he had reached the highest points to which the Jesuits sought to lead him. Now, he's mentioning the Jesuits there because this was, these were these core leaders in the Counter-Reformation. They were teachers, and they developed systems of schools to work against the work of the Protestant Reformation. Continuing here, originality and independence of mind, love of truth for its own sake, the power of reflecting and forming correct judgments were not merely neglected, they were suppressed in the Jesuit system. Now that's fascinating. What did it say? It says the memory was cultivated. They focused on the memory. Why? To suppress good thought and judgment. They didn't want a thinker. 
They didn't want somebody able to make decisions for themselves. They just wanted a system where they would feed the information in and the students would have to remember it. Now, anyone who's been through conventional education, does that sound familiar? <laughs> That's the system it's built upon. And I'll be talking tomorrow morning, I'll be tracing some more of this history down to our modern times, and we'll be looking at statements from the founders and developers of the modern educational system here in the United States. And they explicitly say, we are aiming to destroy a person's free will and ability to think for themselves. And it started with this focus on just memorization. That's false education. It is not well to crowd the mind with studies that require intense application, but that are not brought into use into practical life. So it's one thing to gain knowledge, but if you're not applying it in everyday life, it's not going to do us any good. Such an education will be a loss to the student. It is not enough even to have knowledge. We must have the ability to use the knowledge aright. Now, there's a reason for this. There's a reason Satan has uh, helped develop this false system of education that's focused on just putting knowledge into the mind as an artificial form of mental development. Again, back to studies in Christian education. The papal system of education makes teachers content to repeat set lessons to their students as they themselves learn them in school with no thought of making practical application. The students, in turn, go out to teach others the same rote they have learned, and thus the endless treadmill goes on, ever learning, but never getting anywhere. That's exactly how Satan would have it, friends. He knows that if true education fulfills its purpose, and the knowledge that our young people gain, they begin to put into practical use in everyday life and begin to serve others and begin to spread the gospel that Jesus has said the end will come when that happens. Satan knows all this. He says, I want a system of education that just makes them content to go generation after generation after generation, just repeating the same things, going through it year after year. Because Satan knows as long as this world continues status quo, he stays alive. Friends, we don't want an education that keeps this world going. We want an education that enables our young people to be part of that final generation who could finish the work so that this world can end and Jesus can come. We can have a better world. It is the use they make of knowledge that determines the value of their education. So mental development is important, but that mental development is not complete if it is just information put into the mind. It is only complete if it is information applied and actually put into practice in everyday life. And finally, spiritual development. We've already looked at how education is connected with uh, redemption and how it is a restoration of the image of God in the soul. So we're not going to dwell on this right now, but just remember this. A character formed according to the divine likeness is the only treasure we can take from this world to the next. It's the only thing we're going to take with us. We can't bring our degrees. We can't bring all the knowledge we've gained about worldly topics. It's only our character that we can take with us to heaven. How important then is the development of character in this life? Any effort that exalts the intellectual culture above the moral training is misdirected. That's exactly what our world is to doing today though. And then our third and final component of true education is that true education prepares the student for the joy of service in this world and the higher joy of wider service in the world to come. Fascinating statement in the book, Ministry of Healing. True education is, now I like definitions. <laughs> Let's make this simple. What is true education? Well, if we could um, think about what we've already seen, we could fill in the blank here with a few different things. We could say true education is a process of redemption. We could say true education is harmonious development the physical, mental, and spiritual. We could say true education is the restoration of the image of God in the soul. But what is it here? What is true education here? True education is missionary training. Missionary training. Again, it's about preparing our young people to serve, to spread the gospel, so that that great commission that Jesus spoke about can be fulfilled and he can come. Every son and daughter of God is called to be a missionary. We are called to the service of God and our fellow men, and to fit us for this service should be the object of our education. Wow, that's inspiring. 
Now, how do we make this a little more practical? We read, it is necessary to their complete education that students be given time to do missionary work. First component there, given time, but how many times, friends, <laughs> when it comes to missionary work, do we just hope the students do it on their school break, right? Or we make a little mission trip during the school break. It says, given time to do missionary work. And when you study this out, this is talking about as a part of the curriculum, they're learning how to do missionary work as part of their studies, and then they actually take it out and apply it. Given time is part of the curriculum. But then what kind of missionary work? I mean, are we sending them off to Africa and China every few weeks? You know, that could get it pretty expensive. <laughs> what does this mean, given time to do missionary work? Continuing, it says, time to become acquainted with the spiritual needs of the families in the community around them. This isn't talking about going to Africa and China. This is talking about right here. But that word acquaintance, that's key. The book Education says, it is acquaintance that awakens sympathy. And sympathy is the spring or the source of an effective ministry. Acquaintance awakens sympathy. Sympathy is the source of an effective ministry. So imagine every day you see this man walking past your house. Is your heart drawn out to him and you feel terribly sorry for him? <laughs> You're thinking, why would I be, right? <laughs> Just a man walking past my house. Right, you're not acquainted with him. You have no reason to feel sorry for him. But then one day you're getting the mail and the man comes walking past and you strike up a conversation with him and you, you learn a little bit about him. And you find out that this man, his father died recently and his mother is sick. And so he's going to help care for his mother. He's having to take her groceries and take care of her. But why is he walking? Well, it turns out his car broke down and somebody stole his bicycle. And then a few days ago, he hurt his foot. <laughs> and so as he's walking past your house every day with a hurt foot, he's in pain, he's having to care for his mother. Now do you feel sorry for him? Of course you will, right? Why? Because you were acquainted with him. Your acquaintance with him awakens sympathy in your heart for his situation. Now what are you going to do? We're going to try to help him, right? And so your acquaintance awakens sympathy, and then that sympathy became the source of an effective ministry. So if we want to inspire our young people with a desire to do missionary work, Sitting in the house watching TV is not a very good plan. <laughs> reading books even. Reading books is great. But reading books is not a very good way to awaken sympathy in their hearts. They need to get out and get acquainted. And of course, we can see the attack of Satan in these days with everything that's been happening the last two years to distance people, right? He knows that acquaintance is a key for ministering to them. And it just expounds a little more here. They should not be so loaded down with studies that they have no time to use the knowledge they have acquired. They should be encouraged to make earnest missionary effort for those in error, becoming acquainted with them and taking to them the truth. But then it doesn't stop with acquaintance and working for the community around us. It also says from our colleges and training schools, missionaries are to be sent forth to distant lands. While at school, let the students improve every opportunity to prepare for this work. So you see what's going on? During their education, during their childhood and their youth, they're being acquainted, they're practicing, they're engaged, they're applying what they're learning into service for others. And then as they're graduating, then they're going off into distant lands to work for the master. It's all focused on that preparation for heaven through practicing in service, which is uniting ourselves with Jesus, finishing the work so that he can come home. It's a beautiful system. And again, a, a little more practically how we can do this. When the youth give their hearts to God, your care for them should not cease. But how many times do we do that, friends? Think about that. How many times we're so focused on helping our young people give their hearts to the Lord, which is important. That's the first step. But then when they give their hearts to the Lord and they get baptized, and we're like, whew, Finally, success. 
It says your care for them should not cease. Don't stop there. Don't stop with them giving their hearts to the Lord. There's another step to take. It says lay some special responsibility upon them. Make them feel that they are expected to do something. You've given your heart to the Lord. You're now a soldier in his army. Let's get to work. Let different branches of the missionary work be laid out systematically and let instruction and help be given so that the young may learn to act a part. Friends, this is practical. We are told exactly how to get our young people into the work. Help them give their hearts to the Lord and then engage them in service. That means we should be engaged in service ourselves, right? It'd be a lot easier if we're engaged in service to just bring them along. Have we understood this evening a little more why what we read earlier is so true? That now is never before, we need to understand the true science of education. If we fail to understand this, we shall never have a place in the kingdom of God. This is a vitally important topic. This concerns our redemption. This concerns our development, our character transformation. And this concerns our preparation to work in the Lord's service. This is important stuff. A couple last points I want to make as we draw it to a close This is solemn to consider. Satan's object is effectually gained when, by perverting their ideas of education, he succeeds in getting young people on his side. Is that what that says? He succeeds in enlisting parents and teachers on his side. For a wrong education often starts the mind on the road to infidelity. We read earlier the family. God has decreed that the family is the greatest of educational agencies. Satan's object is gained not when he gets the young people. He does, in a, I mean, his object is gained when he gets the young people. But this is telling us that's not where he starts. He starts with confusing parents' and teachers' ideas of education, which tells us how transformative education is, either true or false education. It's about preparing us for heaven. And if he can confuse parents and teachers in their ideas of education, he'll get the young people in the process. It was the year 1938. Dr. Toshio Yamagata and Elder Francis Millard, who were part of the Japan Union Mission, traveled to meet with Dr. Mizuno, who was the Director of Social and Religious Education for the Nation of Japan. Now, these men from the Adventist School were there to ask this government leader for permission to keep their school open, because this was a time in the nation of Japan when the religious and parochial schools were being closed down across the nation. And so these Adventist leaders were visiting this director of social and religious education for the nation to explain their system of education and why it was valuable and try to convince this government leader to let their school stay open. They explained their plan. They explained what we've looked at this evening. They explained the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual, how they were preparing citizens, useful citizens, teaching them useful work, how they were focused on preparation for heaven, focused on preparation for service. They explained all this to the government leader. And as they finished their explanation, they had a copy of the book Education. They handed it to that government leader and said, if you want to understand our plan better, you can just read this book. This is what we're doing here at our school. And Dr. Mizuno, that renowned government leader of social and religious education, put his hand up. He said, that's okay. I don't need to read your book. I've already read it. He said, I already know your plan. He said, and I'll tell you this. If you follow that plan that's written in this book, Education, you have no reason to worry. We need more schools like that. You can keep your school open. He said, but if you're not following what's written there, if you don't follow your plan, 
you have no reason to exist. We'll shut you down. Friends, we've been given a plan. We've been given a plan for many areas of our lives, not just education. But we've been given a plan laid out by the king of the universe, designed to educate royalty. It's one of the most detailed messages we have. We have so much information written about this. And now the secular science is coming along and saying, oh yeah, that's correct. Oh yeah, that's correct. Oh yeah, that's correct. (laughs) Are we going to wait for the world to catch up? Are we going to accept God's counsel? Trust that we have enough evidence showing its benefit, its value, its role in preparing us for heaven. And are we going to learn from the mistakes of the nation of Israel? As we see that it was false education, a mingling of the worldly and the true that made them not recognize Jesus when he came. And are we going to decide to follow true education so that when Jesus comes, we're ready and we recognize him? Let's follow our plan. Let's educate royalty. Let's be faithful to what God has given us to do. Amen? Let's have prayer. Our Father in heaven, Thank you for this time we've had together to study your beautiful plan of true education. We've but scratched the surface. (laughs) But Lord, I pray this has given us a, a starting point. I pray for the parents, teachers, anyone here involved with the education of children, that you give them special wisdom and guidance. And Lord, for us as adults, that we will be truly educated for your kingdom. Guide us, Lord, as we go back to our homes. Keep us safe. Bring bring us back together again tomorrow to study more of these beautiful principles. And I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. Be sure to invite your friends. Tell them they can join on the live stream. Tomorrow we're looking at four topics. We're going to look at the battle over the mind. There's going to be a lot of science and research in there. That's a fascinating topic. We're going to look at the education of Daniel. We're going to look at some elements of brain development and how a child learns and grows in their early years. That'll be the first one in the afternoon. And then we'll look at the role of the family in true education for our last topic. And then we'll have some time for question and answer. We'll have some books and materials available. Um, And so hope to see you there. Have a good night. Thank you all.